we continue with the gospel lesson, again coming from the time before Jesus' crucifixion, this time from the 17th chapter of John's gospel. This is Jesus' prayer to his Father for his disciples, those who were gathered around him that time and those who would follow, including us. And unlike the other gospels where Jesus prays while the disciples fall asleep, they are listening to his words. They know what he is asking God on their behalf. And so we begin reading at the beginning of chapter 17, the first 11 verses. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to let you in on another little pastoral secret. Weddings are a lot harder to do than funerals. Funerals, you don't usually have a thousand questions or a thousand opinions or mothers of the bride. You don't generally have the mother of the person being remembered. But I know that every time I gather with a couple wanting to get married, when I tell them that the United Methodist Church requires of deacons and elders who perform weddings, of local pastors, all of us, we are only to do a wedding after due counsel. And so they come into my office and they sit down and they want to talk about one thing and one thing only. They want to plan that worship service. And more than once, I've had the same kind of eh, discussion, let's call it, if not a knockdown, drag out fight with a bride who says, what do you mean I don't get to say I do? What do you mean I have to say I will? I want to say I do. I ask him the same question every time. Why do you want to say I do instead of I will? I get the same answer most times because that's how it's done in the movies. Little girls dream their whole lives about saying those words, I do. But in the United Methodist worship service of marriage, and it is a worship service, where the celebrants are the bride and groom and the pastors are only the witnesses for the state and for the church, they're the ones who make their vows to each other. And there is a big difference between I do and I will. I do is talking about what you do right this moment. I will is a verb of the future. It's a transitive verb. I was an English major, and so I do get hung up on meanings and particular meanings of words. But I will implies future. It's something that you are determined to live out. It's easy to look at the boy when he comes there, when she's coming down the aisle to him in all her radiance and beauty, and he is standing there in a tuxedo with his hair combed and his face shaved, looking better than he ever will again. He's even gone past the prom at this point in terms of how good he cleans up. When she looks at him then, it's easy to say, oh, yes, I do. But I'm telling you a little bit of secret. If you've been married, you know that we all don't look as pretty as we did the day we got married every day of our marriage. He's never going to look this good again. He's never going to smell this good again. She is never going to be all this dialed up again. And that is when marriage really happens. And so brides and grooms are a little frustrated when I tell them at the beginning of the premarital counseling period, I care a lot more about your marriage than I do about your wedding. I promise your wedding will be beautiful. It will be as flawless as we can possibly make it. But I care more about your marriage because the wedding is not the culmination of all that has come before. This is not Prince Charming kissing the fairy princess and they lived happily ever after. 
this is what connotes the beginning of a new relationship, a relationship unlike any that anyone has ever had before, two people committing their lives to each other, moving forward in God's name into an unknown future together. There's some aspects of this in the stories that Christina read and the one that I read from the Gospel. Because we are coming to the time of the Ascension, Jesus is leaving the disciples. He is taken up out of their sight into the clouds. And they watch him go and they stand there staring into the sky and I would have done the same thing. I would have been just like the cowardly lion and the scarecrow and the tin man when the wizard took off going, come back because they don't know how in the world they're going to do anything without Jesus. They think he's gone out of their sight, and so they stand there staring into the clouds until two angels have to appear to them and say, get your head out of the clouds. It is time for you to be the church. This comes right before the Pentecost, but in John, Jesus has already breathed the Holy Spirit into them. They just don't know yet what it's going to accomplish through them. It is a lot like a wedding, isn't it? It's the beginning of something new. And if you look back to what we said in John's Gospel, what does Jesus say? Father, the hour has come. Now, if you study John's Gospel or you remember the stories from the beginning, early on, the first miracle in John is not called a miracle, but a sign of who Christ is for these people. It is the wedding at Cana of Galilee. His mother comes to him because they've run out of wine. And what does he say to her? Woman, my hour has not yet come. And even though he says that to her, she tells the servants to do what he says. We know the rest of the story. He turns water into wine, and they're amazed at the abundance and the grace that he shows at that moment. But now he's saying the time has come, the time to be glorified. And we have to look at what glorification means. It's not just exaltation. It's not just praise. It's not about falling down and worshiping. It's about getting up and serving, because what Jesus is saying to the Father is, you have glorified me, and I have glorified you which means very basically, I have made you known to your people. I have made you known through the signs, through the miracles, through the works. I've made you known through the power, and now it is time. And he doesn't say to the disciples, do you believe this, or do you intend to do this? He says, you will be my witnesses. You will be clothed from power on high. Jesus doesn't say to them, you have within you the potential to become my witnesses. Jesus does not say to them, wouldn't it be nice if you all decided that you would witness to me? Jesus says to them what is absolutely the truth. You will be my witnesses. You will be clothed with power and you will witness to me. You will make me known. You will glorify me by revealing me here in Judea. You will go to Samaria. And remember, that was not a place they wanted to go. It was across a different culture and to a people that they had been taught that they could hate and despise and avoid. Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses there. You're going to tell them about my power because my power is going to live in and through you. And then Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Trust me, Cockeysville, Maryland is the end of the earth from first century Palestine. And even though Timonium is actually a Greek word that comes from Timon of Athens, they didn't dream that there would be a suburban Baltimore or a Maryland or United States of America. They didn't even necessarily know that there was a continent on this side of the world at that point. But because they allowed that spirit to work in and through them, because they allowed that spirit to fill them, to take away their fear, to send them into the world, we are here today because their witness was so profound. And we are continually called to continual witness to the power of Jesus Christ. That is how we make him known, and that is how we glorify him. There's been a lot of discussion about opening churches right now, and some people are pushing us to do that. Some people are afraid that the church will not continue if we close for much longer, that people will stop giving their offerings. Let me tell you what has happened with the Margareta Griffith Scholarship Fund. We have had the biggest gift given to date for this scholarship fund. We're going to be able to send our students out with money that will substantially help them to buy books or other things that they need for their education because of the faithfulness of this congregation. I told you last week we have people making masks and we have more people doing more things in the community through their giving but also through their witness. We have folks who take time every week to call someone up to offer encouragement and hope 
That's the power of the Spirit living through us and in us. And we will be back here one day together. But until then, we will continue to be the church because Jesus said we will, and we will do that indeed. The word will has another meaning. It talks about our resolve, our personal will. And we know what it means to say someone is willful. Sometimes we mean stubborn. But what if we were stubborn in our faith? What if we were the ones who said, we will do this in the name of Jesus Christ. We will go into the world. We will celebrate. We will praise. We will serve. We will believe. We will stand in hope against all hopelessness, even in the midst of days like these. Just as in a marriage, it is easy sometimes to say, I do believe, I do believe when things are going our way. We are celebrating when a baby is born. We're celebrating when a marriage happens. But will we, when times are tough, if our children are ill, or if a marriage ends, or if a spouse dies, or when all the other troubles of life overtake us, or when a pandemic threatens the existence of people across God's entire world, will we then? Will we celebrate and give God the glory? I believe, Epworth, that the answer is yes, yes, yes. Because just as in a marriage, Jesus Christ has come into our hearts he and the Father are one, and we are one in him, and we are one together, and nothing can stop us. I want to read you what comes next in John's Gospel. If we skip down a few verses, I'd like to read to you from verses 18 through 23. And these are, again, the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, they also will be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So my question to you who are listening this morning, will you go into all the world? Will you go into your neighborhoods, even remotely right now? Will you go into your neighbor's home by a phone call that shows your caring and your love and your concern? Will you go when we're able to into places that you might not be so comfortable, into neighborhoods where the people don't look like you? into countries throughout the world where people have been called our enemies? Will you go to the places that you never thought you'd be and proclaim Christ and his glory and his truth? Will you go to the ends of the earth? We have folks serving Christ who are part of this congregation in Australia and Liberia. We have folks who travel back and forth to India. We have folks who travel back and forth just up and down York Road. Everywhere we go, we have the opportunity to share who Christ is. That is what gives him glory. Praising him is wonderful together here. Singing hymns. I miss hearing you all sing. I'm sure you're tired of hearing me squeak over here when I don't remember to bring a glass of water or a cough drop with me, and I'm not used to singing at home right now. I can't wait until we can be together, but until then, we are the church, and yes, we will praise God and proclaim Jesus Christ. The ascension, it's a story that has importance for us today because Jesus didn't just leave us. He went to sit at the right hand of God, which means that through his spirit, he is everywhere, everywhere we are, everywhere we ever hope to be. He's there before us. He is there with us. He is there after us. He is there, and through him, we are called to follow that path so that where he is, we will be one, so that where we are together, in isolation or in the building, we are still the church, we are still his body. So it's time to take our heads out of the clouds, and when he says, you will be filled with the Spirit to say, here I am, Lord, fill me. And when he says, you will be my witnesses to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Yes, we will. Amen.